Welcome to part 17 of studying for your extra exam. The amateur extra is element 4 and it is the last stop. So we're on sub element 4 Charlie right now and this is talking about receiver performance of your rigs. So question 1 says what is an effect of excessive phase noise in a serial defined radio's receiver's master clock oscillator? The correct answer is it can combine with strong signals on nearby frequencies to generate interference. So the phase noise combines with another frequency and brings it down to where you are and interferes with you. And that's sort of like a mixer. So it can combine with strong signals on nearby frequencies to generate interference. Which of the following receiver circuits can be effective in eliminating interference from strong out-of-band signals? That is going to be a front-end filter or pre-selector. Now some rigs have these fixed and some rigs have these where you can add them and adjust them. And it just depends on what rig you have and how much money you spend on it. Front-end filters add cost. What is the term for the suppression in an in, in FM receiver of one signal by another stronger signal on the same frequency? And that's called the capture effect. And if you've been on a two meter net or listened even to two meter simplex and two people key up at once, usually only one of them wins out in that battle. That is called the capture effect. What is the noise figure of a receiver? The noise figure is the ratio in decibels of the noise generated by the receiver to the theoretical minimum noise. So if the ratio in that noise figure, you want it to be as low as possible. That tells you how small of a signal you can receive and then noise gets in the way if it's too small. What does a receiver noise floor of negative 170 decibel milliwatts represent? That's the theoretical noise in a one hertz bandwidth at the input of a perfect receiver at room temperature. So that is the answer. Just memorize that it is the theoretical noise in a one hertz bandwidth at the input of a perfect uh, receiver at room temperature. How much does increasing a receiver's bandwidth from 50 hertz to 1,000 hertz increase the receiver's noise floor? So if you can imagine having the front door completely shut, you're not letting in any of the hot air. But if you crack the door a little bit, a little bit of that hot air is going to come through. And then if you have a wide open door all of that hot air is coming through so that's basically what this is talking about if you open up your bandwidth the noise floor is going to increase well we've done this calculation before and we're going to do it again right here it is the difference between the two not the difference subtracted but the ratio between the two so you take 1000 and divide that by 50 and that's going to give you 20. And then you take the logarithmic value of that and multiply times 10. So it's 10 log that ratio in the change difference. And that gives you approximately 13 decibels. So your noise well over, uh, let's see, 3, 6, 9, 12. It just about quadruples between that point, assuming that W1RCP's math is correct. So that's how you can figure that one out. There's only one that I've seen on the test. You're 13 decibels. You're going to see it right there. What does the MDS of a receiver represent? And that is the minimum discernible signal. So MDS might be, let's see if I have one up here. MDS might be a half a microvolt or four microvolts, 0.2 microvolts depending on the range that you're looking at. And you can find those on, you should be able to find those on the specs of the receiver that you have. That is the minimum discernible signal. 
An SDR receiver is overloaded when input signals exceed what level? Well, in order for you to actually check the input, you have a voltage level that you can compare it to to give you that digital number. So if you're at the bottom, that would be a zero, and it rises until you get to the top, which in a 10-bit uh, ADC, or analog to digital converter, would be about 1,024. So when it hits that level, and it stays at that level, that reference voltage of the ADC converter has been exceeded. Now, if you have an ICOM 7300, which is one of the most popular rigs, you'll see it OVF when it's overloaded. Which of the following choices is a good reason for selecting a high intermediate frequency, IF, for a super heterodyne HF or VHF communications receiver? It is easier for front end circuitry to eliminate image responses. So this is a very complicated situation to explain. Your radio has an oscillator that runs on the inside that mixes with the received signal and it produces two different frequencies. Usually your rig is going to use the lower of the two and then it's going to take a sample. So the image, if your IF isn't good enough and your frequency sampling isn't high enough, then you start to get these weird images that appear as distortion. So the correct answer for this one, it's easier for front end circuitry to eliminate image responses. And I have a couple of these that uh, highlighted. The ICOM 7300 is right at 36 kilohertz. If we go to a Yaesu, I believe this is a 710, it is, the first is 69.45 megahertz. That's most likely for mixing with your VHF and UHF, or VHF, and the second is 450 kilohertz. So we'll look at a 710. This is the 710. I don't even know what I said for the Yaesu. That's the FT891. Now the 710 has an inter intermediate frequency of 18 kilohertz. And for AM and FM is 24 kilohertz. Let's look at one more. Let's look at Kenwood, the third of these three big manufacturers. You can see that there are a quite a few intermediate frequencies. You have 8 megahertz, 11, 73, and some change. Then you have a second for FM and a third for FM. And that way you can bring it down and be able to take a really good sampling. Now, this is uh, probably one of your more expensive radios. And so that is why it has a lot more of those frequencies in it. What is an advantage of having a variety of receiver bandwidths from which to select? Well, back to that open door. You know, do you want to let a lizard in? Well, if you let the lizard in, then you're going to let a little bit of heat in. But if you need to let the uh, kitty cat in, then you're going to let a little bit more heat in. Then if you let the elephant in, well, that's, that's more noise. So you're going to, you have to deal with the fact that the elephant's coming through, but it's also going to let more noise through. So receive bandwidth can be set to match the modulation bandwidth maximizing signal noise ratio and minimizing interference. So if you're doing Morse code, you might have a filter of only 350 to 500 hertz so that you eliminate all of that noise. But then let's say that you boost that and go to SSB to listen to CW. Well, now you're 2.8, 2.4, 3 kilohertz wide. Your noise level is going to go up immensely. We did that math just a minute ago. Why does input attenuation reduce receiver overload on the lower frequency HF bands with little or no impact on signal to noise ratio? That is because atmospheric noise is generally greater 
than internally generated noise even after attenuation. On most modern rigs, using surface mount parts and uh, being designed, the better ones, being designed with uh, temperature offsets for certain parts so that they don't, if the temperature rises, the resistance of one might fall and the other one might go up to counteract each other. Um, so there's very little noise inside of your good rig. Atmospheric noise is usually going to be greater than what's in your radio. So that's why attenuation on those lower frequencies is not going to have an impact on your SNR. How does a narrowband roofing filter affect receiver performance? It provides blocking dynamic range by attenuating strong signals near the received frequency. And so if you can really roof that filter it's going to block out a lot of that strong signals that are nearby. Question 13, what is reciprocal mixing? So this is some accidental mixing that happens in your radios. It's where local oscillator, well, the IF happens to be a local oscillator, but if they have phase noise that is creeping, uh, then you get a and with those adjacent strong signals to create interference where you want to listen. So you you want to pick a rig that has low oscillator phase noise. A lot of times there'll be some good shielding built in. Uh, there's there's quite a bit that affects that. So local oscillator phase noise mixing with adjacent strong signals to create interference to desired signals. That is your reciprocal mixing. So think about reciprocal being into the same device. What is the purpose of the receiver intermediate frequency shift control? Some rigs have this and some rigs do not, but that is to reduce interference from stations transmitting on adjacent frequencies. So if you can shift that IF just a little bit, you can kind of attenuate some of that adjacent frequency interference coming through. This has been a tough section and it goes more to using your rigs than it does anything else. So I hope that my explanations have been somewhat helpful. Finding pictures for some of this was not that easy for this section. Hey, if you like this series, like each video that you watch and subscribe to the channel to show your support. I'll keep them coming. I'm Rob, W1RCP is 73.